very much for um, inviting me here. I, um, I'm actually thrilled to be part of this kind of framing and um, also uh, a little um, uh, frazzled because there's so many projects I want to talk to in the context um, of, um, of trans agriculture and um, what actually I think is um, an interesting um, crisis. And we've heard a lot about the crisis of you know, the climate crisis and the food crisis. And, um, and what I'm really interested in is the crisis that they reveal, which is a crisis of agency, right? This idea of what to do, what the hell to do, right? <laughs> in the face of global climate change. Here we are with every single technological advantage, every communication, educational, developed world advantage, and we don't know what to do, right? <laughs> so that kind of crisis of agency, I think, is actually the cultural and technical crisis that um, perhaps is the most insidious. And, um, and it's that interrogation of, of the limits and the capacities of our agency that, um, that I'm very interested in. And so I want to introduce you to a couple of um, uh, th three, kind of, I'm organizing this talk into three sections. First, the Environmental Health Clinic, um, and then Ooze, and then this uh, new extension of the Ooze project. But first, the Environmental Health Clinic. Um, which is how I've set up my new lab at NYU. You see it's a little twist on health. Um, can I show it to you again? Oh, that's a <laughs> well, actually, what happened there? Ah, two. Okay. Um, it's a, um, an idea of taking this, this notion of health as not one that's medical and internal and individual and atomized, but one that's external, uh, part of the, uh, you know, it's a common good. Like any common good, the fact that I have it doesn't take away from you having it. Like any common good, markets aren't very good at dealing with them. Right? Um, so the environmental health clinic functions like um, uh, a health clinic. It takes the familiar script of a health clinic. Anyone can ring up and make an appointment, right? Um, you don't have to be an environmental activist or a media artist to um, understand how to interact with uh, the environmental health clinic. You come with environmental health concerns as opposed to health concerns or medical concerns, and you walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for lifestyle experiments, for monitoring protocols, for design interventions, for things you can do to measurably imp improve your local environmental health. I just want to actually read a quote from Hippocrates that you can't read here, the same guy who um, churned out the Hippocratic Oath. Um, the greater part of the soul lays outside the body, Treatment of the inner requires treatment of the outer. And I want to just take one more moment to kind of understand what it means to reframe health in this way where, um, you know, the good work of environmentalists for the last 30 years has been to create environmental issues so that they are global enough to be newsworthy, right? We always talk about global climate change. It's not enough to flatten a major city in, uh, you know, in uh, Louisiana. Um, it has to be part of global climate change. It's not enough to lose a couple of species from your park, or even sparrows, you know, f disappeared from London, uh, you know, even though they've cohabited with us for 2,000 years, even though Shakespeare said um, there is special provenance in the fall of a sparrow. They've gone, but it's not enough to have this local ext extirpation of, of, of species. It has to be part of global biodiversity loss, right? So this globalized discourse has a very unfortunate consequence that it renders environmental issues so that not local enough to be actionable, right? It's taken out of our hands. Anything we can do is by definition marginal or insignificant. And, um, and that's obviously um, a problem. So the Environmental Health Clinic is, um, just going through it quickly, um, is a place where we sit and we talk about environmental uh, health concerns actually. Often we, um, we have field offices in the Environmental Health Clinic, um, just to show you one of the field offices. Oh boy, um, where did that go? Here's, um, no, we don't need that. Okay, oh, this was the wobbly part of it. So this is one of the, um, Environmental Health Clinic, uh, fl this floating office, 
where we um, talked about, uh, and this was actually, we, I, uh, just after that, I banished men. This is a women's environmental health clinic because um, men weigh too much. They, <laughs> um, but it's obviously an, uh, a reimagining our relationship to natural systems comes in many forms. Um, so when you come to the clinic, what, what I was actually um, giving uh, them was a prescription. One of the prescriptions is for um, this monitoring protocol called the Tadpole Bureaucrat Monitoring Protocol, which is um, additions of American bullfrog tadpoles, um, each of which are named after a local bureaucrat whose decisions affect water quality, right? So this is Commissioner Granis, who's the head of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, <laughs> who we co-housed with um, Denise Sheehan. Um, and of course, we do this because these little creatures, these strange little fellows, are the most exquisitely sensitive biosensors we have to the whole class of industrial contaminants known as endocrine disruptors. I mean, they go through a very similar adolescence to us, except it's even more tra traumatic. They dissolve organs and grow new limbs. We grow stubs of limbs and things, but we, you know, it's very, their, their, their traumatic adolescence is, is um, well, their developmental events are very observable, and we can observe how and um, uh, how they are interrupted by many of these industrial pollutants that reflect the biological effects our own bodies experience. I could watch this for a long time, but I'm going to skip forward. So this is called the, um, the uh, Tadpole Bureaucrat Biomonitoring Protocol, or keeping tabs, if you will. Um, we, an inpatient comes to the clinic concerned for water quality, and uh, they prescribe these tadpole bureaucrats. They raise them in a water sample. Um, in which they're concerned, the end of which they introduce them to their namesake, right, and discuss the evidence that they've found. Um, but we also have companion um, animal devices to really learn to love the tadpole, to cohabit with them. Um, and this, for instance, is a, uh, the tadpole walker. So you can take your tadpole out for walks in the evening. Of course, this um, you then have to explain to your neighbors why you are taking out um, your tadpole for a walk. And then you have to really interpolate. Of course, your neighbors are interested probably in the very same water samples you're interested in. Um, but this, these whole, um, the effects, the biological effects that the, that the, uh, um, um, by, uh, the toxicology of the, um, of the tadpoles reflect on things like uh, the breast cancer epidemic, the obesity epidemic or the two and a half year drop in the average age of onset of menarche and young girls in America, um, and many of these other public health issues. Um, instead of coming to the, instead of being asked for a urine sample when you come to the environmental health clinic, you're asked for a mouse sample. So a mouse, does anybody here have a mouse in the house? You see, somebody's brave enough to... Congratulations. <laughs> they actually turn out to be better monitors of your environmental health than you are yourself. And so the first thing with, uh, with uh, um, anyone who's lucky enough to have a mouse in their house is um, to design a better mouse trap. This is one of the mouse traps we designed for a uh, curator who... Um, this is actually a gallery in Yale who is on antidepressants, and um, it involves... Um, is anybody here on antidepressants? Oh. In New York, everyone is, but um, the question was, would mice actually self-administer antidepressants? So you can see on these spoons are the Zoloft and Pro, uh, Prozac and a black jelly bean with the, that and a muscle relaxant. Um, in the, in the um, tubes uh, is vodka in solution, gin in solution, uh, plain water and um, muscle relaxant in solution. Does anybody want to guess which they liked best? Vodka. I'll have you know that. I mean, that's ratifying of something, right? I found that encouraging. Um, they also did self-administer antidepressants, which is very interesting. I don't know if you know the test. Actually, you know, like 95% of, of all pharmaceuticals, they're only tested on mice and rats before they're administered to people, right? Obviously, they're, they're a model organism. And to test antidepressants, um, you know, the, the test is a marvelous protocol where they dose the mice um, or rats with the antidepressants and they throw them in a tub of water and um, 
they measure the, the effectiveness of the, the, t uh, of the um, antidepressant, the SSRI, by how long the mouse, uh, how, you know, they'll swim to try and not drown. And um, the uh, length of time, the shorter the length of time, the more effective the antidepressant, right? So when they give up and drown, uh, that's, um, that's demonstrating the effectiveness of the antidepressant. Anyway, so they did, in fact, um, like Zoloft, better than Prozac and did, oh, and, and the, the main thing is that when they go into the enclosure, there's an old cell phone in there that they trigger, um, which immediately calls the environmental health clinic, um, and we come along and pick up the mouse. We take a blood sample and a hair sample from the mouse and we send that off to human um, testing labs, actually, because it's much cheaper than animal testing labs. So, um, you know, the mice, of course, have a smaller body mass, the, the same reasons why they're a great model organism for us. Um, in other ways, um, they reproduce quickly, but in, in this case, they share our house, right? They share our home, they are, a, are our domestic partners. Um, they share the diet, right? They share the same lead levels and asbestos levels, the same as environmental stressors, the same um, EMF. And, um, and they're territorially more limited, right? We don't know your body burden, your lead levels, your arsenic levels, whether you were exposed in childhood or occupationally, on your last vacation, when you came to a conference. What we um, do know is that mice don't travel as much, and so they actually represent our environmental health much better than we do ourselves, and are invaluable um, uh, as a, a, a source of information in this respect. I want to show this, um, uh, again, in the, the class of monitoring protocols. This one um, is another inexpensive uh, monitoring protocol that's prescribed for people who are concerned about uh, air quality, and this is the one that really, um, I think, uh, addresses the, um, the representational crisis we face. Um, in 1970, in the US, they passed the Clean Air Act, which has had a substantial effect on the air quality and in um, urban centers. Um, uh, the Bush administration came up with something called the Clear Skies Initiative, which sounds pretty good, right? Clean air, clear skies. What's the difference? Sounds good. Clear Skies Initiative was actually the dismantling of the Clean Air Act. Um, clear skies means 17-fold increases in mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants, right? How does that work? Clear skies, more pollution, right? That's doublespeak, right? That's what Orwell talked about, is it doublespeak? Um, and so words are failing us, right? We're in a context in which words don't mean what they have meant. So how do we respond? And this is, um, the Clear Skies initiative, uh, the Clear Skies question mark. Um, face mask tries to address this. Um, it's a standard OSHA approved N95 particulate matter mask that's been adapted with a photographer's grayscale. You wear it around as you ride your bike, walk through town, and the grime that accumulates on, your, on, the, on the, um, the mask that would otherwise lodge in your pretty pink lungs can be read off against the grayscale, right? To give you a stochastically robust measure of the air quality that you are directly being exposed to, right? So we have a material representation, visual, legible, and also um, one that allows you to speak without talking, if you will, a micro, micro propaganda moment. Um, and in, actually, as we've additioned these, people have um, been invited to annotate their own little speech bubble. My favorite still remains um, simply someone who wrote um, Bush Smells, which <laughs> um, was just, I don't know, quite nice. Okay, so in addition to, um, these are mon those are the sort of class of uh, monitoring protocols. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of prescriptions, three quick prescriptions um, that I've been working on. And um, actually, I find these hard to do quickly, but um, people who are concerned for air quality um, is, uh, often will get a prescription for a green light system, which looks like this. It's actually a high efficiency LED light fixture that's designed not only to you know, lend light to human activities, but also to support plant growth. Um, it's an entire system. The LEDs have been sp uh, spectrally tuned, so they do support plant growth, unlike uh, most efficient LEDs. Um, and we do this uh, because, of course, 
indoor air quality, where we spend 90% of our time, as we make our energy, our buildings perform better environmentally, our indoor air quality is getting much, much worse, right? We seal them better, we insulate them better, and the buildup of indoor, common indoor air contaminants, formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, well-known carcinogens, neurotoxicants, um, build up. So plants and soil microbes are the best nanotechnology we have at absorbing and sequestering and fixing um, these um, um, contaminants. We run all of this, we run this system on a solar awning. And a solar awning has a number of interesting features. This is a whole system. You'll see, note that it's small scale, um, something you put up yourself. I want to show you this is what we've been working on. Um, uh, you can see here that by actually removing, let me take that back again. Uh, one quick thing to say about, you can put photovoltaics on your roof. Anybody can put photovoltaics on the roof if you have $40,000 and a roof. Um, but many of us don't have that. Um, some of us have a, a window or maybe two, maybe a south facing window. Um, so we can put up an awning ourselves, but the difference between putting up an awning on a window and putting a photovoltaic on the roof is that it's visible, right? It's like putting out a flag. So in addition to reducing the heat gain, awning, awnings are actually well-known technologies. They reduce heat gain, they improve, you know, they're, they're not um, rocket science, but they, they work very well. But we've, um, again, been adapting that by um, making the awning not only photovoltaic, removing less than 10% of the material to create a time-varying shadow that um, moves across and gives you an ambient display of the solar energy, which you can play with um, quite a bit. So as you know, the, um, the pinhole effect, what you get on the ground by putting small holes in it is um, an image of the sun. Um, and by putting several images, you can actually have these time-varying shadows that um, move across an interior dialogue, if you will, with the external um, conditions. So um, this is some of the issues with the salt on. Every prescription product has a lot of fine print, of course. Um, and this is just to talk about um, the concrete understanding that one might get if you put up a, a system, right? The typical way we deal with this kind of, this is a closed and coupled system. The typical way that we deal with all environmental issues, including air quality, is by displacing them. There's toxic sludge in the Hudson River. We pump it out and ship it off to Pennsylvania or the nearest third world country. Same thing. Um, or, um, uh, you know, we just displace it. Air quality, you know, we just push it out, make it someone else. In fact, building zoning requires that, you know, you flush indoor air with outdoor air, right? Just push it out there, um, which, of course, is based on the assumption that outdoor air quality is better than indoor air quality. But outdoors, we have, you know, ozone, mercury. Uh, indoors, we have formaldehyde, <laughs> benzene. So we, anyway, we spend a lot of energy pushing them around. Is there a different way to deal with our environmental issues. Instead of just displacing them, can we treat them locally? Um, and that's what this system is making concrete in a small and, I think, comprehensible way. Um, so that by putting up one of these, you might actually develop robust intuitions about how much, you know, how much energy do you generate where you are with a five-foot square uh, awning? Can you charge your computer and three cell phones and run your lights? And if you can have this concrete idea of what distributed local power production looks like, then you can better engage with the political decisions that are being made about how we design alternative power systems. One more, uh, two more prescriptions. One, this is a prescription called the no park, um, which takes a no parking zone like those associated with a fire hydrant in New York. There's about two or three of these on every block in Manhattan and therefore um, emergency vehicle parking. Um, but they're sort of for this old version of the emergency, right? Um, what the prescription actually, again, for people concerned for water quality, um, the prescription involves the removal of the asphalt and the creation of an engineered microlandscape that will infiltrate roadborne pollution. Um, now, roadborne pollution is the biggest 
pollution burden on the New York, New Jersey um, harbour, and that's the case in many major cities. Industrial waste no longer, domestic, and we have this medieval practice of, of sewage uh, going into the harbour in Manhattan, but but that's all overwhelmed by the massive network of impervious surfaces that you know the roads that very efficiently collects every you know all that oily hydrocarbon waste, the cadmium neurotoxins, all the all the gunk, and every rain event washes it very efficiently straight into the estuary system, where it's devastating. If, however, we intercept that with these infiltration bioswales or um, engineered microlandscapes, um, we can of course bind all that stuff on the surface area of the soils and um, replenish, rehydrate the entire block. The street trees like it. Um, but we also do something about, we know a lot about how much street trees now affect urban air quality. All those effects are leaf surface area related. There's a tragically named uh, phenomena that I find actually really quite uh, well, tragic. Um, uh, does anybody, has anyone heard of the stroller height effect? The boundary layer in urban air quality, um, which uh, the lowest, you know, where the tailpipes are, where swilling all the, um, all those unburnt hydrocarbons. Um, uh, the parent pushing the child in a stroller, the stroller height effect, um, will experience about a thousand times better air quality than the child in the stroller, right? Um, it's one of those, uh, uh, how you know, one of the insanity, insanity. So, um, leaf surface area, of course, captures particulate matter, fixes CO2, does um, provides environmental services. We're surgically inserting leaf surface area right at that area, that stroller height effect, where um, you know the the um, the space continues to function as a emergency p a vehicle parking space. A fire truck can come along and park, flatten a few plants, big deal, they'll regenerate. But now you know 99.9% .9 of the time, the rest of the time, it's servicing and redefining the emergency. It's servicing the environmental health emergency, infiltrating roadborne pollution, improving. Um, and quality, and just as a um, a quick indicator, uh, if we actually changed every uh, fire hydrant in Manhattan to a no park, um, we would absorb all the roadborne pollution, preventing it all from going um, into the into the estuary system um, up to a seven inch, that is, up to a hundred year storm event. So these can be small but uh, effective actions that can have a large and considerable effect. They each have um, they each have different soil types, different planning strategies. For instance, this is the butterfly truck stop, which provides habitat for the 40 species of butterflies that appear in, in Manhattan Island. Um, this is, uh, you know what truck stops are. I think it's important to note that when we set this up within 15 minutes, three species of butterflies appeared in April. Um, and you know, it was as if they were sitting behind cars, waiting for a patch of vegetation to appear, and they suddenly, you know, was, uh, they have any, you know, a missile monitoring system. Was, it was um, extraordinary to see how quickly they responded to this. This is another planning strategy, the new planning strategy that I've been working a lot on. It's called the Climate Clock um, No Park. And what it does is plant, um, Blooming uh, low-growth shrubs in uh, in um, phenological order. So the phenological disturbances, you know, you know when things bloom, are the most sensitive indicators of climate disruption. By planting them in this systematic way, we can see we can read off that perturbation, um, and we actually read this particular one with a, a fingernail tattoo. Right, that has your fingernails grow at about two millimeters a month, and so the color-coded fingernail tattoo allows you to calibrate your own biological responses with the larger uh, biological responses to remind us of this thing that we find kind of surprising. That, you know that we are also inside nature, part of natural systems, subject to these environmental stressors. Um, Okay, final prescription I want to show you. This is an ambitious one that, um, who knows, it's been, um, uh, uh, it asks the question of um, what would a fallout shelter for the climate crisis look like? 
Because I think that the fallout shelters that appeared around the world in like minutes, right? They went up everywhere. They were put up by individuals, by schools, by community groups, everywhere, suddenly, in like months. Um, they were in libraries and churches everywhere, right? Um, and I think they remain as a kind of icon of mobilization of what um, a civil response might be in the face of shared collective threat. Because I really think that, um, you know, buying a local lettuce, um, swapping your light bulbs, driving at the speed limit, the kind of instructives we're given aren't sufficient, right? They don't feel, they don't say, exercise our agency. So in this case, um, um, I'd suggest that a, uh, the bomb shelter for the climate crisis looks something like this, the urban space station, which is an intensive agriculture facility designed for urban rooftops. It lands on a urban roof and is, um, it's on legs because it, you know, roofs are not made for urban agriculture as much as we would like them all to be. Um, but if you focus all the load on the masonry walls and the columns, where we've got effectively infinite um, load-bearing capacity, you can, in fact, put on a considerable amount of weight. Um, and then you uh, free up the, the roof area for about, uh, you know, the one to three inches of soil that it can support for habitat provisioning. Um, this urban agriculture facility plugs into the building in a mutualism, a parasitic mutualism relationship. Um, that is, it takes the CO2 enriched air from the building, produced by you and I and our machines, plugs it into the greenhouse, um, just like in a commercial greenhouse, right, where they actually manufacture CO2 to get the 40% growth yields that, um, increase in growth yields that um, raised CO2 levels produce. It then supplies, resupplies oxygen enriched air back to the building. Um, it's about a, in commercial greenhouses, you force through CO2 enriched air about once every minute. Um, building department code requires you circulate air in once every 20 minutes in an occupied building. So we've got a 20 to 1 volume ratio. Um, the important part of this is it's called a space station because it appropriates the materials and the space frames and the systems design from um, space technologies. This is a 40% scale model that um, was in the Reina Sophia um, over summer and um, uh, worked okay. This is what it might look like this summer installed in Manhattan. Um, the whole thing is designed to be, ra to be um, as modular using these space frames um, so that it can be built as a barn raising. And this investment in the structure of participation that you've, you've begun to recognize through these projects is that if you've built something, you know how it works, right? You know how to maintain it, and you know how to build it better. The investment in um, a barn raising uh, version is, uh, pays off um, in uh, all sorts of ways. Okay. Uh, now, now this is what I really want to talk to you about. Um, anyone can um, come to the Environmental Health Clinic. I do residencies. Uh, in fact, there's some medical students that are coming to do residencies, uh, case-based, uh, um, as an invitation to come. As oh, did I tell you that people who come to the to the clinic are called impatients, right? Because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address local environmental health. Um, and so you are all invited to be impatient, to celebrate your impatience. But one of the things that have co that's come out of actually an, a longer project um, that I've been doing for a while is called the Ooze Project. And that's uh, Ooze is zoo backwards and without cages, obviously. Um, uh, which is really a project to reimagine our relationship to natural systems through the eyes of our non-human neighbors, our cohabitants. Um, and this is a phenomena that um, we've actually, uh, really, has, 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 the last eight years has been extraordinary. In, certainly in New York City parks, and oh, I don't know here, um, every park, the most, the, the sign you see the most is do not feed the animals. You've got to ask why, <laughs> right? 
more than the name of the park. In Yellowstone National Park, you see, uh, you see the sign, do not feed the animals, more than you'll see any animal, right, that you might be th threatened to, uh, to feed. Why not feed the animals? The received wisdom is, of course, you'll interfere with them. You'll make them dependent on you. You'll, well, actually, at zoos, they're very concerned for you not to feed the animals. It's on everything. Because, um, because it's not good for them, right? Human food is good enough for us, but not for them, right? And it's true, the sparrows, one of the leading theories about why the sparrows are disappearing is the um, high LLD cholesterol, right, from their androgenic diet. It's not good for them, it's killing them off, right? Um, the, um, so yeah, human food is not good for them, but it's not good for us either in, all, in the same, very similar ways. Um, this idea that we'll interfere with them, that we'll make them dependent on us. When you, you know, uh, in, in any national park, I mean, it's crazy, right? You don't think about making, interfering them, with them on the, on the freeway that you take to get to that national park that cuts off the migration route, that reduces the resources. That we're changing the entire global climate, and we're suddenly worried that we're interfering. Of course we're interfering with them. Of course we are. We are, of course we are. So um, maybe we could feed the animals. Um, certainly, they're coming to us. And this phenomena of urban migration, which I learned in school, was a phenomena that described the movement of the rural poor into urban centres. And we all know that now there are more people living in urban centres than ever before. That, as sort of the major activity uh, that explained the last couple of centuries, has ended. And now what's happened, <laughs> urban migration actually is, is more typically used to describe the, uh, the movement of animals formerly known as wild into urban centers, right? So that's the um, you know, wild turkey in Battery Park City. There's, there's a coyote in, in Central Park. There was a whale in the Gowanus Canal. There was, uh, the seals have moved in, three types of seals have moved into the Hudson River in the last five years. They keep coming back. Um, I know in, in uh, Germany, near um, uh, Karlsruhe, there's a, uh, the, f the ferret phenomena of them moving in is, is really noticeable because the ferrets really like to chew on brake fluid um, lines, which has catastrophic results. Anyway, it's, it's very noticeable. Um, but, um, but animals are moving in to urban centers at a rate we've never witnessed before. And why? Anyone have a theory? Because we're feeding them too much? <laughs> um, you know, of course, the loss of viable habitat elsewhere, right, is pushing them more and more into the center. There are so many coyote in, in, um, in Chicago at the moment. There's more coyote in Chicago than has ever been counted ever in the history of the United States, right? Um, why? Every um, green space, you know, maybe, our, maybe our cities are becoming more livable. Every green space is, for instance, a, uh, an invitation to non-humans to cohabit. Right, and that Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act might have had some effect. Certainly, the seals think so. Um, but the front, if there was a, um, a animal liberation front, um, the kind of what would be called the terrorists, of course, is the geese. The geese are moving in, and they have the chutzpah to move into golf courses and sports fields. Which, um, and they do have chutzpah, right? Which, but if you were advising them what would be most hostile territory, and stay away from the golf courses, right? <laughs> you know, the golf players have got a sense of, uh, you know, um, I don't know, I'm not going to say anything bad about golf players, but, um, but and nonetheless, they don't like geese, geese don't like them. Um, why don't people like geese? They're noisy. They're noisy? Yeah, they have chutzpah. And they shit. I mean, they poo. I mean, yeah. So, so we do too, right? But they 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 poo. This is a, a measure of civilization, how we deal with poo. And I think we can. Um, I think actually we can use technologies to reinvent our relationship to um, these non-humans um, to script more productive interactions um, than we've typically seen. And this was the first um, ooze interface, um, a robotic. Goose. Um, actually, there's now 17 robotic geese 
at large in various places. The very first commission for the Ooze project was here in the Netherlands. Oh, excuse me for a minute. Okay, this is a first. Okay. I'm addressing the situation. Six <laughs> percent, ah. all right. Okay, okay. So um, actually in um, Diva Building, the, um, the land art uh, landscape um, uh, museum, uh, the commission, the, the, there's a permanently installed robotic goose interface in um, just down the road, in the Polderlands, not far. But this, um, this is an interface that allows you to harass your local goose population. That is, you can drive it around and chase or follow or um, uh, irritate your local geese back. Not only can you um, follow them, but you can talk to them. You can actually issue pre-recorded goose words uh, from Lorenz, and actually hunters um, turn out to be great goose linguists. Um, you can also, in fact, uh, um, just say through walkie-talkie, you know, quack or hello or um, try, try it out. Um, every time you issue a pre-recorded, um, yeah, this gets ugly there, but, um, you know, they, um, the swans, are, they have even more of it. Um, the, every time you issue a pre-recorded um, word the, uh, or say something to the geese, it actually samples back a few seconds what the geese do back. So we build up a, da a database that actually, well, how did you learn a language, right? You don't actually learn it from a dictionary or from a formal source, from a, an animal linguistic source. You learn it by interaction attempts, right? And so I would argue this robotic geese, goose interface is how we might learn goose. Um, and it also works best with children who are child labor when it comes to uh, harassing geese is the way to go. Much cheaper than graduate students. Um, and uh, children are, of course, language acquisition experts, tireless goose harassers, and incredibly good at interpreting what the geese are saying. Um, this is an interface, another interface um, with another kind of... Um, character, urban character, urban animal character that we cohabit with more and less well. Um, this is a perch. Perch technology is, um, oh, and you can see underneath the perch is, um, is public toilets for pigeons. Um, the poop problem can be solved. We've done it before. Um, this, uh, you can see it's a, both plumbing and surface, you know, so it captures the uh, poop and every kind of precipitation runs it down into a collection uh, tube where it can then be taken to fertilize. Pigeon poop is the best organic fertilizer. We have the MPK balanced uh, fertilizer. But anyway, this is actually not about the poop. This is about um, talking, uh, again, communicating with humans. So this is perch technology, uh, which allows, um, which translates bird concerns into human dialect. Um, so this is actually installed in the, um, do we have the sound on? Um, this, this is actually, there were six of these perches installed in the Whitney Museum sculpture court um, and used by the birds. Um, when a bird lands on these perches, it triggers a sound file that says something like this. Uh, here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. So, um, so there was actually six different perches. Each of them had a different argument on them. Some of the arguments were for, you know, copyright dues, for melodic resources and cell phone <coughs> tones. Um, others were... Um, <coughs> appealed, you know, in more traditional ways, but this was the one that the birds triggered the most often. This was the one that the birds decided was the most effective at eliciting cooperative behavior from the people below. And it said this. 
Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. This is an interface for fish um, who also need to translate or signal to us. Um, these are buoys that are going in the East River. They project um, up and down three feet, and they have a number of sensors in them, including a fish detector, you know, uh, inexpensive fish detector, so that when the fish runs goes underneath it, the, um, it uh, turns on the light, creating a low-resolution display of fish presence. Um, I want to show you this one because this, I think, most, again, f sets up the feedback cycle, if you will. Um, fish learn that when the lights go on, food is likely to be there. People learn that when the lights go on, fish are likely to be there, right? So we have this coupled system. And have you ever noticed in urban water bodies of water, the bagels and the stale white bread that's floating around on the... On the, yeah, right. The, um, that the f it's not nutritionally appropriate. Right? I don't know why people like to feed bagels to fish in New York, but maybe I don't know. Anyway, they, um, the idea with this interface is that we've actually spent um, uh, part of the cross species cookbook is a um, is a chapter on the fish restaurant where you feed fish rather than eat them, and the fish food is in fact nutritionally appropriate. Um, I is not stale bread. It's, in fact, an alginate-based um, product that um, can augment the nutritional resources, potentially even augment the population, right? Feedback or f feeding. Um, and it has embedded in a chelating agent, just like the chelating agents we actually use. That when the fish ingest it, it binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals, the PCBs, and they poop it out as in, its, in, a, in a complex form um, where it's less bioreactive, where it settles into the, uh, into the um, silt and is effectively removed from the chain. Right, so I'm just telling you that example as one concrete example, the way that we can script interaction, not in this, in this method of suicide environmentalism, right? Suicide environmentalism is the idea that I got from two of my students came up to me and said, you know, I care a lot about the environment. And in fact, for undergraduate students, they care so much, they could care less about the war. They only care about the environment, in fact. Um, they, um, two of my students have said to me, you know, if being a good environmentalist is driving less, you know, turning off your lights, using less paper, you know, eating less, um, reducing your footprint, reducing your carbon, in, you know, it's all about reducing, right? Then shouldn't I just suicide? That's the most effective, you know, that's the logical extension of this reduction thesis of what you can't do, of environmentalism, of hand-wringing, leave no trace, do not touch, do not feed the animals, right? But what about what you can do? What about that agency to do something and to make it good? Right, that's the kind of um, script of interaction that I'm very interested in using these um, projects to explore. I'm going to show you three more interfaces to animals. I have to show you another pigeon one because you just feasted on pigeons, and um, so you need to see this. Um, this is a model urban development for, uh, for the birds. Um, it, uh, it's permanently installed on the roof of Postmaster's Gallery in Chelsea, Manhattan. And it involves 36 different planting schemes um, and a whole really functioning model urban development, including a concert hall, um, seven architect-designed housing facilities, including a Rem Cool House, Casa de Musica. Um, uh, these are all actually, at, obviously, at bird scale. In fact, the model urban development works at bird scale. This is planning strategies. Um, the, the whole thing is powered by anaerobic digest from human food waste from local restaurants. 
Anaerobic digest is a really light nitrogenous fertilizer. Um, the first, these are um, five planting um, areas that are identically planted but fertilized with the anaerobic digest in the first case from McDonald's, in the second case from a vegan restaurant called Snice, in the third case from a French restaurant, and the fourth case from a um, Italian restaurant. So we'll be you know, seeing how the plants like these different culinary traditions. Um, the, um, there's a whole uh, set of other biodegradable um, recent electronic purchases, um, biodegradable wedding dress. Um, there's a book says uh, cellulose as uh, literature as cellulose. Um, so there's some books up there biodegrading, particularly books on garbage. A few copies of my dissertation up there biodegrading. Um, uh, and there's a there's a, a table for a feed a food court, um, and this is where we try out different. Um, menus for the birds. And um, pointed at this table is a gun, a bird operatable gun, right, which is actually um, a high pressure water valve that can be triggered. When it shoots, it knocks every bird off the table, right? So will the birds use technological advantage to monopolize nutritional resources is the question, right? Or will they this is the other Millennium Wheel, another facility there. Um, or will they use leisure? After all, urbanization is a production of leisure, right? They have all their food, water, you know, some nice places to hang out. Where will they, uh, what will happen? Will they shoot each other to set old scores? Or will they um, hang out on the uh, Ferris wheel? And I want to take a vote. Who thinks the Ferris wheel? Six, seven. Who thinks the gun? <laughs> About 20, 25. Okay. Cynics. <laughs> I'll have you know that uh, we can turn off the sound from this actually. Oh. Is this playing? Yeah. Watch carefully. You know, we can see where they like to hang out, which um, different areas they prefer. Um, but here, yeah, watch it. Slow down a bit. You seeing? Where are they hanging around? You see that? <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, um, let that be a lesson to you. I want to show you um, two more interfaces, and then I'm really going to be quiet. Um, uh, th this is actually from a show we've just opened called um, uh, The New Black. Um, and you know the sparrow issue I keep bringing up? Right, there's actually the leading theory about the sparrow issue. Sparrows have effectively disappeared from London, New York, um, Amsterdam, really. They're gone after hanging around with us for literally millennia. Um, they're okay in Paris and Berlin, apparently, but um, London, New York, Amsterdam, nowhere. Um, insects are now the biggest leading theory, right, that the disappearance of, um, of insects is one of the issues. There's also another catas catastrophe that was homegrown in New York State last winter, something called the white nose syndrome, um, where they found in the major bat caves in New York State a 90 to 95 percent death rate, um, and all the carcasses of bats had little white furry noses from a fungus growing around their nose. So like the bee catastrophe, right, the colony collapse disorder, which wiped out, I'm still not quite sure what was going on, um, but 
certainly, I think the reason why we all know about the bee catastrophe is because the first time we realized that, you know, uh, we are critically dependent out <laughs> on these busy little bees, right? Whole industries, almonds, everything, you know, um, almonds, apples, <laughs> everything. We're, we're so dependent on these little bees, and I think we didn't quite realize that before. So this whole level, this trophic layer of where are the insects and what's going on with them is um, um, something that has to be dealt with. So I'd like to introduce you to an old sport that we've um, actually been uh, reinvented somewhat. Um, this is the strongest animal in the world the rhinoceros beetle. Um, here they are wrestling. Take note of that. Look at that. <laughs> so that's, the, that's what they do. They throw each other off the log. Um, we could go on with that, but let's go. So um, wouldn't you like to wrestle with the strongest animal in the world? Um, well, now you can. Um, we've spent the last little while and I think at this point I should ask uh, this strapping young man here, uh, moving very fast, is actually Chris Wobkin, who's sitting right here, who's been working very closely with me on, on rhinoceros beetle wrestling and other um, tremendously useful activities. Um, so here we are, building a device that in fact scales humans to um, beetle wrestling scale, so uh, uh, making the, the for, through mechanical advantage and leverage, we um, create a system where you can, in fact, take on the strongest animal in the world. This goes on and on. What it looks like is, um, is this. Um, Here it is installed in the, um, the Van Allen. And here is the first uh, footage of beetle wrestling by a very competent and, in fact, extremely strong young woman. Um, So, um, the way this works is that we've been um, actually, uh, let me play that for you again, that issuing uh, formal challenges to Hemingway-esque guys, um, that is uh, literary giants and swaggering museum directors and a few arrogant architects, to come and actually wrestle with the beetle. We'll be taking bets on the outcome of who will win. And this, of course, is the new funding strategy for ooze, or who's. Um, uh, let me give you an insight to the odds. Um, we can lift about twice our weight, uh, or maybe you can lift about twice your weight, but uh, these guys can lift 38 times their weight. Um, uh, so be scared. Um, now. Uh, this also provides the opportunity to address the insect insectivorous resources. And what we've been developing is these bat interf interfaces. So the bat, um, you might have heard of the High Line, which is a, a new park going in Manhattan, which is introducing more vegetation and resources for uh, habitat provisions for insects. Where you have insects, you have bats. In fact, the bats are already there and are regularly reported by um, local residents when they squeal to their superintendents to come and beat the bats to death if they find them in their, um, in their homes, which they do. Um, but instead of that as an interface, we've, um, we think we can do a little bit better. We've taken the, um, the billboards that are proximal to the, the High Line and we've developed a system where we, in fact, use the waste heat, let me actually have these, use the waste heat from the um, steam heating system in Manhattan 
built uh, post-war with um, a great deal of redundancy. This vigorous and wasteful system typically runs waste heat directly into the estuary system. We're intersecting that and producing a temperature stabilized environment for the bats as an alternative to these fungus infested um, caves. On the other side of the bat um, billboards is a market rate um, billboard. We actually have invited a number of advertisers to develop bat positive advertising. Uh, Toyota has already complied with a big ad that says cavernous and has, uh, I can show you that later, um, but there's a couple of other fashion designers in the area who are developing pro-bat advertising um, to, in fact, uh, the, you know, the bats are managing. I, I should tell you something about Ooze is actually incorporated. It's a um, uh, not yet publicly trading company, but will be. But uh, as a company, uh, I think it's something peculiar about American law is that the 14th Amendment means that um, companies have personhood, right? That means that they, um, they limited liability. The board of directors, you can kill a lot of people in Bhopal and, and you can still keep your Mercedes, right, um, if you're on the board, right? So this, this idea that companies actually have protected and have personhood means that by incorporating ooze and putting on the board a few bats and other non-humans, we are in fact granting them personhood um, and exploring other means of production. Another interface is in fact a bat translator um, that fixes onto the street poles and as the bats um, and ambiently translates the sound with a simple ultrasonic detector um, to a small speaker on the, so you can hear the bats appearing dee -dee 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 -dee, and then appearing on the next street pole and the next one. Um, but to your cell phone, you actually get the translation um, uh, sent, um, twittered to you. Uh, you can see, can you see that? Uh, anyway, you, you can, you'll have to sign up for the twittering. That'll come in a second. Um, here's the system set up. Um, oh my goodness. I've got things a little bit out of, out of, okay. And of course we need equipment for bat hunting. Um, the bats uh, come out because of this white nose syndrome and coming out in winter, um, their fat stores have run out, they're starving, they're coming out. Um, so we're about to go back to Manhattan and start the first bat hunts with the following device. This is a, well, we haven't quite thought of a name yet, but a umbrella gun bat detector thing. Um, and I don't know if any of you have held a gun. I really, just in your head, imagine holding a gun and imagine, imagine holding a little, well, like an iPhone, a little box of electronics. What feels better? I can tell you if you haven't uh, held one, a gun feels better. A gun is just a, it's almost like a part de deux partner. You feel, you feel powerful, you feel masculine, you feel, um, you feel like a superhero. Um, they're great things to hold. Um, but their function is a little limited, right? So we've improved their function. We've actually, again, engineered what you might have recognized through these architectures of reciprocity. You can hear the bats. We've got a um, uh, ultrasonic mic and infrared camera on the tip. So we focus the, the, the sound um, in this uh, area. Um, and we go out bat hunting. Um, and just in uh, a final thing, I'd like to introduce you to the new Ooze uh, website, the Wildlife Habitat Ooze that we've recently launched. Um, I am finishing now, but I want you all to get out your cell phones, if you will, for a minute. And I wonder if this will work from here. How many people hear Twitter? A few, enough. Okay, well anyway, get out your phones and put this in, um, because if you don't Twitter already, you will, twi you'll, you will Twitter now. What's happening here? I'm very, very slow. Um, so what I want you to do is, uh, to the following number, 40404, put follow whose. 
right? Just text that to 40404, follow who's. And that means, uh, then you'll get a text back, that every time you see a jellyfish in, in your uh, coyote, and well, you don't see coyotes, I don't know if you see jellyfish, whatever you see here, yeah, a pigeon or a rat, or oh, look, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, or a, um, Katie, what's happening here? Somehow not, uh, it's not loading, I'm sorry. Um, well, let me show you this anyway. Every, whenever you see a rat, I mean, it's, it's an exclamatory moment, right? People say, you know, I just saw a rat, or I just saw a, a I mean, it's, it's one of those things that people always tell you when they've seen a non-human neighbor appear. It's, a, it's, it's worth noting. And now you can note it to someone. You can send it to who's. And what this enables us to do with everyone twittering and reporting their uh, non-human neighbors we, um, we can actually do wild animal safaris in real time in Manhattan, conveniently, and uh, the Bronx. Um, we've renamed the, the island um, known as Manhattan for its, uh, as a wildlife habitat because, in fact, these non-humans do cohabit. Um, uh, and we've out every area except, it's now known as Decentral Park. Um, and that is outside of Central Park, where animals cohabit. Um, there's also the Bronx Ooze, which is um, the entire Bronx, except for New York Botanic Gardens, and the Bronx Zoo, the largest zoo in, um, in the US. Um, and now we have the Bronx Ooze, which is not actually showing here. But you can come for a wild animal safari in Manhattan or the Bronx. Um, and in fact, also note that we do cohabit with these non-humans. Who's, as the uh, poses the question of whose territory is it anyway? Who, to whom do the nutritional resources belong? The airspace, the insectivorous resources, the water, and the um, territory itself. Can we reimagine how to share these resources? Can we use the opportunity that new technologies present to re-script that interaction? And can we, I think it's important to kind of understand, um, there's one last project I'll mention, which is uh, you know, uh, the Enlightenment Project, right? It's the older project. I had nothing to do with it, I promise. Um, the Enlightenment Project uh, you know, was this idea that if you gave information to everyone, that would lead to action. We've tried that for a few hundred years. We know a lot about global warming. You haven't seen anyone abandoning their cars. You know, information does not necessarily lead to action. The work to translate into actions, to re-script our interactions into collective action, to restructure our participation, and to reimagine our relationship to natural systems it takes work, it takes play, and I hope you'll all join me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Natalie. Um, would you mind to oh. stay here with us yes. just for another 10, <laughs> 15 minutes? Thanks for this uh, fantastic and quite intense ride through your, your work. Um, I'm still trying to sort of get my head around it, but I, but I suppose what you're, what you're asking us is, is um, to sort of, I mean, we, we, we've been asking uh, other forms of life to sort of redefine uh, their, their like, you know, like all these animals you mentioned, to define their, and not just animals, but all sorts of organisms, to sort of redefine their relationship with, with the human form, right? Um, wh whereas, you know, we seem to still have a rather conservative uh, 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 notion of, uh, or actually praxis of interacting with these other forms of life, and, and, and you sort of, you know, try to find, you know, sort of, more adequate ways, more sort of, um, yeah, also technologically enhanced ways of, of, of interaction. I mean, there's one thing, there is a species in Amsterdam, which is, I, th I suppose, sort of at least a little bit human, that, that, that um, it's a sort of an army of people that, whose, whose entire existence seems to be defined 
by walking around with big plastic bags and doing nothing but feeding the pigeons. So I mean, the, the, maybe this is a, this is a, uh, a species that you need more more of in, in New York, and maybe we can export some of these people to, uh, you know, so, solve the health problem of New York pigeons. But um, I mean. Uh, forget the second <laughs> comment, but the first <laughs> yes. one, is that, is, that, is that something that... that yeah, I think, I, mean, I think it's one, one diagnostic, and uh, uh, this, will, this will be my last diagnostic. Uh, um, I think we all understand that, that uh, we're kind of locked in an in a indelible contract, a social uh, contract with plants, for instance, humble plants, right? We, you know, we have this exchange of bodily fluids that goes on. We all know this, right? You know, we breathe out, they breathe in. We, you know. But how many people, for instance, know how much leaf surface area is required just to fix the CO2 that you yourself produced? How many plants do you need to, to sequester your own CO2? Does anybody have a, even a guess? Five? That's a guess? Right. Well, actually, yeah, the leaf surface area, if you add it all up, is sort of... Is, what I'm, I suppose I'm using this diagnostic for is, I think a good way to estimate that is, you know, they're only uh, transpiring some of the time in sunlight, um, so we need double. Um, and the, the um, chlorophyll is about as, approximately as effective at um, grabbing as, as hemoglobin is at releasing. So we have a kind of an equivalent function. So we need about as much surface area as our lungs in leaf surface area, doubled because they're not doing that. Right, why don't we know this? Why don't we, any, I mean like, there couldn't be a more kind of fundamental relationship, right? And we haven't instrumentalized that, we haven't kind of, we don't even, we don't even, we haven't explored it, we haven't imagined what it might be like to live with enough plants to, you know, what, how would that, what would that look like? Might that be interesting? So that's a kind of lifestyle experiment that I think is, is fascinating, fundamental, and if we can't actually understand these, these kind of fundamental contracts, then how do we make the kind of larger political decisions around which to build a viable alternative future, right? Uh, it reminds me, uh, there, there has been this project, but it's all, all, uh, usually seen as a science project, uh, the Biosphere 2, which is actually an interesting art project and should be also um, discussed better as such, um, which is of course about this whole closed loop and about what would it look like very literally to have this, uh, what do we need, uh, including uh, miniature goats and that sort of thing. Um, I think actually we just, um, Chris and I were just at the Biosphere 2, <laughs> in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a precedent, right? It's, uh, and it's, it could have only happened in America, but I think there's a couple of interesting things to understand about, um, uh, it's been, uh, about Biosphere 2. Is, you know, it was an exercise in cultural deprivation, first and foremost. It was also an exercise funded by an oil baron of how much energy you could use, right? A very thin layer of vegetation. And it had um, huge basements, the basement for the desert, the basement for the rainforest, the basement for, you know, vastly more complicated. They, they didn't use any natural systems, right? They didn't even use water filtration through the soil. They had a water purification machine. They didn't use, I mean, it was, it was, it came out of a different time and iconically it has a closed system mentality but it's been overrun by cockroaches and cra crazy ants, um, which is, um, I think, the, the moral of the story. Um, the, uh, it's now um, cost $2 million a month to keep open, um, and now they have it. They've just last week announced it as a teacher training facility um, because it's being passed off like... A, so, it, you know, it, the critique and exploration of what happened the, uh, um, in this strange... Um, uh, thing is, I think, fascinating. I think you're right. It's an extraordinary cultural project. Uh, but, um, but the systems design is very different. It didn't actually exploit the environmental services that we understand now. Um, it used a closed system analogy, whereas I'm instrumentalizing, uh, instrumentalizing 
not, not the bounded closed system, but the coupled system, where um, they're closed and coupled. So you're bound only to recouple. Um, so it comes from systems engineering, and but um, you don't want to see the. Uh, it, it's it's um, just by coupling the sort of tradition of industrial ecology. Just by coupling systems, we can make. Um, we can make systems like 90% more f efficient, right? N you know, the kind of effects we can have by uh, reducing, recycling, um, materials, innovations, you know, are percentage points. Um, but by coupling systems, we can have these large effects. And it means an attention to a kind of dynamic um, system. But I think it's, it's certainly there are many opportunities to explore that. So, I, uh, so yeah. I think the Biosphere 2 is, is an interesting precedent, a catastrophic uh, precedent, um, and we can do much better now. I know I spoke for a long time, but um, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, <laughs> um, the Bronx Ooze has just launched, as I said, um, and it's uh, centered at the uh, uh, the Bronx River Arts Centre, which is a small community arts centre and museum um, that is the only museum in the, the only uh, arts centre uh, that's dedicated to environmental issues in the, in the US. Um, it's set right on the uh, Bronx River, uh, actually in the flood, flood plain. In front of it is the tangle of Robert Moses freeways, including the Cross Bronx Expressway that mean that the area has the highest death and hospitalization rate from asthma um, in the country. Um, and it also has a lot of coyotes, uh, a beaver, and um, three blocks south of the Bronx Zoo and backing onto the, um, the New York Botanic Gardens. I'm telling you all this because the, um, Maybe they want me to go out that door. Um, because the, the first artist in residence uh, is starting in January, um, Rachel Mayeri, a second artist in residence, Colin Ives, who does marvelous work. Um, uh, and a, a third couple of environmental artists are working, uh, or artists are working over summer. Um, this is just launched to anyone who's interested in exploring um, the wilderness of New York. Um, please propose, please um, um, come help reimagine our relationship to natural systems and have some fun with the animals in New York. So that's an invitation to, to leave with you. Thank you. <laughs>